when you learn a foreign language, you know you are getting better when you start understanding idioms. And I don't mean idiots, because you can never understand idiots, but idioms. For example, in English you say, cool as a cucumber, right? Makes no sense whatsoever. Or raining cats and dogs. These are good examples of idioms. Another one is when we say that it is not written in the stone, which means that it's open to interpretation or it's flexible. Something can be changed or edited. And surprisingly, this one comes all the way from the book of Exodus and the two stone tablets that Moses is carrying up the mountain in today's first reading. Of course, on his way up, the stones were literally empty. There was nothing inscribed in them just yet. But after a time of encounter with God, the Exodus says that God himself inscribed the commandments on these tablets. So Moses, carrying his iPads under his shoulders, is going down from the mountain, happy to announce all the commandments to his people. When he comes down, he sees a golden calf they made for themselves. So angry and disappointed, Moses throws down the stone tablets on the ground and they break into hundreds of pieces. That's why we don't know if there were 10 commandments originally, or 15, or 20, God knows how many. So there is take two. Moses goes up the mountain again, and this time, according to Exodus, Moses himself is carving the stone tablets. I would imagine it took him longer than God the first time around. But he comes down and the nation and the people of Israel is carrying these tablets in an ark as a sign of covenant. Of course, if you have seen the Indiana Jones movies, you know, you know that we have lost the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets inside them. Nobody knows where they are, no matter what Hollywood tells you. So we actually take the book of Exodus without having any proof of what was inscribed on those original two stone tablets. I'm mentioning the idiom of nothing being written in stone because it keeps reminding me that we too have to be open to additions, adjustments, corrections. More than once or twice we have to admit that the first version wasn't so good as it should be or as it could be. And at this point 
I would like to say that I was wrong. About six years ago, when we in St. Louis witnessed all the civil unrest in Ferguson, when we were living to the first wave of what we are living through now again. In one of my sermons six years ago, I was preaching on how all lives matter. And I remember I got an applause at the end of my sermon. My point was, at least it meant to be inclusive, that yes, black lives do matter, but so do blue and red and white and everything else. So my intention was good. But since, thank goodness, it wasn't written in stone, I have to say today it was wrong and cruel of me to give that sermon. You ask how and why? Picture this. Your husband or your wife comes to you with a new makeup of freshly shaved, smiles and says, honey, do you love me? And you can say, I love everyone, which hopefully is correct, right? Which is true. I hope you do love everyone, but when your wife is asking you, do you love me? Don't be a smart aleck and say, I love everyone. You have to say, yes, honey, of course, and you look fantastic today. When your coworker is distressed and depressed and tells you that her mother passed away, You can say, we all are going to die one day, which is true and accurate, but it is also cruel and heartless to say to someone who just lost her or his parent. When someone opens up to you and tells you, my mother died, you don't say, everybody's going to die. You say, I'm so sorry to hear that. And give them a hug. Send them condolences card. You talk about that mother who died. Not everyone is going to die. And so when our African-American brothers and sisters are suffering injustice, when they fight for freedom and equality, and they tell us that their lives matter, we can be smart aleck, and say, all lives matter. And we are true and correct, but we are wrong in saying that. It is not our place, if you are a white person, it is not our place to tell our neighbors how to feel, how to grieve, how to experience that moment of pain. Just as it is not your person to tell your coworker who lost her mother how to grieve and how to feel. 
It is not our person to lecture someone who is fighting for their life. It is our person to stand by with them, to fight with them, to love them. And here we come to the Gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. If you call yourself Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, your answer has to be love. Not lecturing, not excusing, not mansplaining, but loving. If God's answer to our broken condition, to our complicated lives, is love, love must be your answer as well. And when you realize that you made a mistake, when you realize that you said something that wasn't compassionate, that perhaps was true and accurate, but it was cruel, remember, it is not written in stone. It's never too late to say I was wrong. And I was six years ago. Remember that the right answer to pain and grief is love. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen.